Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Precision Planting. Welcome to Winter Conference 2020. Uh, we're excited to have all you here in Tremont. I also want to welcome all of those joining over the simulcast. You know, this event is being sent out to a number of locations all across North America today with a bunch of growers joining us to, to just talk about, you know, what we learned. Our team looks forward to this all year round as we do research and, and develop products and, and are out in the field. Uh, you know, this is kind of the culmination of that where we get to share what we're learning and some of the, the challenges of 2019, right? There were plenty of those this last year, but there were also a lot of successes and a, a lot of great things that we learned. And so we want to jump in and start talking through that. You're going to hear from a number of different presenters throughout the day. Uh, some of our engineers are agronomists, and we're going to start off by bringing one of our agronomists up here. Uh, many of you know Jason Webster and have followed him for years as he does just practical research out there on the farm, just, you know, he's, he's a farmer and you see that, but he's a great agronomist and he's constantly testing and pushing stuff. And a few years ago, we kind of embarked on a new adventure called the PTI Farm. So about an hour from here up by Pontiac, Illinois, there's about 300 acres that Jason is doing testing on. And really it's intended to be kind of your test farm. So there's plots and research, also an opportunity for you to come out and visit that farm and test equipment. And so we're going to start with Jason, just sharing, hey, what did we do? What did he do in 2019? And what were some of those learnings that hopefully we could take and set up for a better planting season here in 2020? So join me in welcoming Jason Webster. Thank you, sir. Hey, good morning. Thank you for coming to Winter Conference 2020. We've got a great day in store for you folks today. As Justin said, my name is Jason Webster. I'm a lead commercial agronomist and I manage and direct the PTI farm, the Precision Technology Institute in Pontiac. And today, over the next, you know, this morning, over the next few short minutes, we're going to dive into agronomic data that we learned from the PTI farm. But before we dive into data, I want to describe and summarize what PTI is because we are kind of still the new kid on the block. We acquired the PTI farm in 2018, so I've got the 18 season the 19 season under our belt, but you know, some of you folks have had the opportunity to come to the PTI farm, and we're humbled and we're glad that you were able to do it. But some of you folks may not even heard of what it is quite yet. So before we dive into the data, I think we at least ought to talk about what it is for you folks that aren't familiar. Our farm in Pontiac is 320 acres of nothing but side-by-side on-farm research. We're gonna talk about challenging the status quo all day today here at Winter Conference, and that's what we do at the PTI farm, okay? We, we have tons of on-farm research. We're, we're trying to find problems in the field. If we're gonna come up with solutions, we gotta at least know we've got a problem out there in the field to begin with. That's half the battle, so that's what we're doing. You know, we are not one field day and done at the PTI farm. You know, when growers come to Pontiac, Illinois, we're right off Interstate 55. We're doing field days out here from right after the 4th of July all the way through. Well, this year we went to September 15th. Every day, bringing growers out. Somewhat small groups, we're 40 people to a session. We do two sessions a day. So 80 people a day at the PTI farm. We had thousands of people from across the world come out to visit us. And every day was different. Every day was different. Why is that? Because, you know, I'll take you guys out to the field and show you what agronomy trials we're working on. I'll talk about what they are, what we're trying to accomplish, and then it's your turn to talk. So every day is a conversation. You may have something going on different at your farm versus what you have versus what you have, and we just talk about it as a group and we all learn. That's why every day was different. It was just amazing. We also have at PTI is, is something unique, and I'm, I thought this was the missing link to an on-farm research center. We bring equipment and technology to the research farm. You see, as farmers, I'm a farmer too, just like you guys. I think this is my 33rd year of farming. It will be here in, in 2020. And to do our job right on the farm, we have to have equipment. We have to have technology to do the work. And sometimes keeping up with technology, just knowing what's available, and more importantly, knowing how it works, can be difficult. You see, a lot of you folks drove a vehicle in to Winter Conference today. It's your vehicle. You went and bought that vehicle. You went to your car dealership and you said, hey, I like that vehicle right there. Did any of you buy the vehicle before you test drove it? 
Anybody ever done that before? Just going up to a car dealer lot and said, that's the vehicle I want, I'll take it, I'll write a check right now without driving it. Anybody ever done that? No, I'm venturing to say all of you guys have done that. I got one that raised their hand. You liked it enough, you bought it, yeah. But every vehicle I've gotten, I've gone in and I test drove it. And if I liked it, I bought it. How do you do that with farm equipment? It's difficult. So what we do at PTI is we bring all the technology, all the equipment in. I'm going to show you what we're doing with the equipment and technology in their agronomy trials, and then we're going to give you the keys and say, here, go. We'll have some of our product support members in the cab of the tractor with you to talk about the technology, what it is, so you can have the best experience. But you get to see what it does and evaluate it and say, is this technology I may want for my farm? Okay? So we put a little video together of some of the, the producers that did come to PTI last year, and this is what it looked like in the sandbox. We've got under 40 acres at the PTI farm that I don't plant every spring. I hold it back because when you come visit us at PTI in July, August, and September, I want you to plant it. And so we'll have the technology here and you guys will be able to experience it if you like. So you have a personal invitation on behalf of Precision Planning and myself. We'd love to see you this summer at the PTI farm. How do you sign up? How do you go to the PTI farm? Just talk to your local Precision Planning premier dealer and they can get you all signed up and we hope to see you. July, August, and September. When you come to the farm, you're gonna hear us say this, that we're gonna challenge the status quo. We're gonna take everything that you guys feel comfortable with and what you're doing today, those farm operations, those best management practices that you're doing on your farm, and we're gonna compare it to something else. See, here's what happens. I talk to a lot of growers during the growing season, and I'll ask them, how come you're putting on nitrogen the way you're doing it? How come you're doing the tillage the way you're doing it? How come you're doing the seeding the way you're doing it? And sometimes the response is, well, that's what we've done for a long time. That's the way granddad did it. That's the way dad did it. And by golly, that's the way I'm going to do it because that's what we know. And is it right? It might be. It might be the perfect thing for your farm. But how do you know unless we're constantly comparing it to something else to see if we can get higher yields and higher profitability? That's what we do at the PTI farm. So we think the seven most expensive words in business, we don't care what business it is. I think it applies to every business. Today we're going to talk about the, the business of farming. We've always done it that way, to me, is not acceptable. We've always got to be comparing ourselves to something different to see if it's better. Here's a, a quote that I think really summarizes PTI. Effectiveness is doing the right things, while efficiency is doing those things right. Those are two things that we work on daily at the research farm. Okay, now that we know what PTI is, let's dive in to some of the agronomic research. What did we learn? We, we we're going through all of our trials. We've got a ton of trials on the farm. And I told our, our PTI team, I said, let's just rank them from top to bottom by revenue. And I said, I don't know where this thing's going to end up. Let's just rank them from the things that made us the most money to the things that cost us the most money in 2019. Well, I'm going to share with you the top 10 here this morning. Here's the top 10 as we ranked them. And I, was, I looked at this list and I was surprised at first. The number one practice, best management practice that made us the most money involved corn planting date and those conditions that we planted into. Anybody surprised by that? I was looking for something a little more flashy when I put this list together, but I think back about the 2019 season and I said, you know what, this doesn't surprise me. Did any of you have any challenges planting the crop in 2019? Probably a lot of you, right? There were some things that, that happened on the planter that if we didn't set right, it cost us dearly. Downforce was one of them. We'll talk about that all today during winter conference. But I'm gonna show you what it cost me yield-wise when I got it wrong and what did it cost me on a per acre basis. And I think the numbers are staggering, okay? We'll talk about germination. We'll talk about nitrogen, nutrition. We'll talk about a lot about nutrition here today and how we're setting up some of our fertility programs 
to reallocate some of our nutrients and some of our dollars. But this is our top 10 list and we're gonna go through each one of these. Let's go back to planning date. I know some of you folks wanna forget 2019, but I'm worried about 2020 based on what we did in 2019. We planted by the calendar. We did not plant when conditions were fit. It was hard in our planting date studies. We like to plant corn every single week and find out when was the best time to plant corn and then figure out why. But it was hard to plant every week when it was raining like this every other day. It was challenging, we had wet conditions. Here's a precipitation map from the months of April and May in 2019 and this is why all of us struggled to get the crop planted. Just way too much rain, wet conditions. We sat out virtually the whole month of May in many cases. It's wet, it's raining, and we're looking at the calendar. And we're saying, oh my gosh, we are late. We should have had this crop in the ground. And whenever we got a window, whether it was fit or not, we tried to go in to plant. Here's what I did. I watched my neighbors. We were all getting nervous. And when we could get into the field, we would try to go plant. In our planting date studies, I'd watch the neighbors. And when they would try to get in, try to get in to plant, I would go in and put an entry into our planting date study. And I'd just say, what's happening here? How is this thing doing? As a result, we got our planters in and they're looking like this. Anybody's planter look like this here this spring? We were mudding in corn, but that's, we were planting by the calendar. We were getting nervous. We go back and we look at the data and our early planted corn in our planting date study just crushed us. Actually, our best date to plant corn this past year was May 20th, kind of an odd year. But when we pushed conditions, we tried to plant by the calendar, when we got in there that last week of April, we pushed it into wet conditions, we got crushed. How much did we get crushed? 57 to 67 bushel to the acre. You can put all the technology on a planter you want, but if you plant into mud, you're gonna struggle. We all know that. This is yield. Look at the yield going later. And I know 2019 was a challenging year, an interesting year. I don't know if it'll ever happen again, but planting later really didn't hurt us. Yes, I ended up with higher moisture corn by planting later, but I planted in good conditions and yield really didn't suffer on the back end. It really suffered on the front end. Look at the dollars here. You take that yield times the price of corn. We use 367, a rolling 12 month cash price for corn, October 118 to October 119. And there's almost a $250 loss by planting corn into tough conditions too early. We tried to force it and it just didn't work. It was tough to get a perfect stand of corn when we pushed it in those tough conditions. As we waited later, June 5th, I think that's a date that was on my mind all spring because that was the prevent plant corn date for us at Pontiac at the PTI farm. And that was the first day we actually got fit. Real good planting conditions. And that was the day that we could have said, you know what? We're gonna throw in the towel and we're gonna collect insurance and not even plant. A lot of farmers had to deal with that. But when we planted starting June 5th, we started to get corn stands that looked like this, some really nice stands. The early stuff we planted in tough conditions, where we got them in, they, it suffered because of additional rainfall that happened and it was cold. There you see a heat gun on top of this planted corn, 41 degrees, is that a good environment? If we're gonna give that first drink of corn, 41 degrees, is that a good thing? This is where we really got hurt. And some of it comes back to the seed that we planted germination wise, putting it in those, those cold, wet conditions. And so we test all of our seed at our PTI farm and we do three tests on our corn. We do warm tests, cold tests, and saturated cold germ tests. And I wanna go through each of these real quick. Here's what you're gonna get from your seed companies. So when you go and order seed, you're gonna get the seed delivered to your farm on the tag. It'll show you a warm germ. This is where we put seed in 77 degree moist soil and we see how many seeds germ. This is information you can get from your, your seed companies. This simulates you planting into perfect seed bed conditions at planting time, in my, my opinion. And then we do a cold test. We say, you know what? The last test was just warm conditions. Let's give it just enough moisture in cold 50 degree temperatures, put it in the chamber for seven days, and then we'll put it back in warm weather for four days to finish it. We see how many seeds germinated in that situation. So that simulates you planting into cold conditions, but not cold, wet. You can get this information from your seed companies too. A lot of times it's on the tag of the bag. What we do not get is the saturated cold germination test. This is not available to us. We don't know what these levels are. So we send the seed off, we get it tested. This is where we put seed in 100% saturated soils, 50 degrees, so it's cold and wet. Put it in the chamber for seven days, 
And then we put it into a warm chamber for four days to finish it. And that tells us, I mean, it's kind of a pre-stress test. It tells us if we put that seed into tough conditions, how well is it going to do? And I want to tell you a story of what we had at PTI this last year. I sent all my corn off and there was two that came back that I was interested in. One of them came back. We're just, we're just going to call the hybrids, hybrids A and hybrid B to protect the guilty here. Okay. Hybrid A came back with an 87, well, let's just do warm and cold here. You see these values, these are actually on the tag of the bags. Those are all great, those look fantastic, I don't see any problems with them. It doesn't tell the whole story though. We get a saturated cold germ test and look at the difference. Hybrid A comes in at 87, which is actually a really good saturated cold score. Hybrid B comes in at 40%. When we put it in cold, wet conditions, that hybrid B, only 40% of the seed actually germed. What does this tell you? Is hybrid B a bad hybrid? No, it's not a bad hybrid. I ordered the hybrid. I wanted it. I went to my seed dealer and said, yep, I want hybrid B. But we sent it off. We got it tested. And it's just telling us that if you put that thing in the cold, wet conditions, she's going to struggle. I took it to the field. I planted it in those cold, wet conditions. And I wanted to see if the test was right. Will it struggle? Here's what happened. I go out the last week of April, first time I could get into the field. And I planted hybrid A and hybrid B. I had my planter set at 36,000 for my seed drop. Hybrid B that tested 40% on that saturated cold germ gave me a final stand of 15,000. Hybrid A with the 87% gave me a really good stand, 33,000. I took the same two hybrids then and I planted them June 5th. When soils, when, when they warmed up and they dried out and we actually had really good conditions and the whole scenario changed. That 40% saturated cold germ score that gave me 15,000 early in cold wet conditions now has given me a 34,000 stand. You see what we did? It was a pre-stress test. It told us that corn's going to struggle if you put it in cold, wet conditions. So what do you do? You test your corn, get these results back. What do you do with the, with the data? Do you send the hybrid back to your seed company? I didn't. I just said, I'm just not going to plant it in those cold, wet conditions. That's all we're trying to find out here. How much did it cost us with that reduced stand, a half a stand, if you will? Compared to hybrid A, we lost over 50 five bushel to the acre times that 367 price for, for corn, and it's over $200 an acre. This is the information we're not getting about the corn that we're planting, and so we simply send this off. Anybody know what it costs for a saturated cold germ test to be done? Anybody know what the cost is? $25, there's a gentleman over here, $25, that's it. So spending $25 could have potentially saved me over $200 an acre. What's the rate of return on that? Anybody have a 401k account? Anybody have a stock portfolio? What's a great rate of return? Is it 719%? Would that be good in those accounts? I think it would be. For a $25 test, this is potentially the return we could have gotten on this. You know, I travel around the country talking to growers about agronomy, and I ask them, are you guys doing this saturated cold germ test? And 18% of the growers right now are saying that, yep, we do it. 82% say we're not doing it or we don't know anything about it. Here's the thing, the 18% of the, the people that are doing this test, here's the nice thing about it, I think they're seed dealers. I think they're the farmer dealers that are selling seed to their customers and are worried about this. They're not getting the information from their seed company, they're doing it themselves. Some of this is from Precision Planting Premier Dealers. They're testing a lot of seed for you folks that you're gonna plant showing you the proper meter settings, things like that, and then they're sending it off. So I think this needs to be done more to give us that pre-stress test. So just a simple $25 test can tell us that. What else was big this past year? Downforce, didn't matter if you were in wet conditions or dry conditions, downforce was pretty severe this year if, we've, if we got it wrong. We paid a penalty. What is downforce, real quick? I like to plant corn at two inches in depth for the most part. But if I'm gonna plant it two inches, I've gotta have enough weight on my row unit to maintain ground contact and get me that two inch planting depth, okay? So here's what happens. If that row unit starts to come up, I don't have enough weight on it, that two inches that I've got the depth set at, she starts to shallow up. And what's the consequence of that? We've all probably done this before. We have the risk of planting seed into dry dirt. The other side of this, if I have too much weight on a row unit, now I'm plowing. Now I'm creating a compaction zone. Soil density where roots potentially can't get out of the compaction zone to get to precious water and nutrients. 
So we've got to monitor this as we plant. We use hydraulic cylinders, we use our delta force, and we use load sensors. Sensors, let's talk about that for a minute. You're going to hear me, as well as the other presenters today, talk about sensing technology. As we plant, we're going to measure, and we're going to react off of that measurement. We do that with downforce, we're sensing. How much weight do we need on the row unit to get me that two-inch planting depth? And we'll adjust the weight. See, here's the deal with downforce. Dry soils, we take the water out of soil, the soil becomes harder. And now to get that two-inch planting depth, I need to add more weight to the row unit. On the other hand, if we bring water back into the mix, into the, into the soil, now we get softer soils, and a lot of times we need to lift. But we're lifting and pushing down all the way across the field, measuring the conditions and reacting accordingly. This is the PTI farm. This is our core principle study where we try to do things wrong. We try to do things right as well, but we'll show you the differences when we do things incorrectly. And this is our downforce study. So if you look at the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see our stand of corn where we had proper downforce, using the sensing, using the measuring to lift up and push down to make sure we get perfect ground contact and the perfect depth. The picture on the right is where we told the planter to lighten up. And this is where she's coming up out of the ground. See, this was planted the first week of June in conventional tillage, corn after corn. So we worked this ground, and this was after it started to warm up and dry out. Winds are blowing 30 mile an hour. You guys ever had in conventional tillage where that top two inches dries out? That's what we had here. The top two inches were dry. We had plenty of moisture underneath, but when we had the proper, the improper downforce, that row unit's coming up and my two inch planting depth is getting into the dry zone. Once we planted this corn, we didn't get a rain for two weeks. And so what happened to that corn that was sitting in dry dirt? It just sat there until the rain came, then it was able to take in water and actually emerge. But you, if you look close enough at that picture, you'll see some tall plants and you'll see some short plants in sporadic emergence. And that's gonna cause us some issues. How much of an issue did it cost us? By getting too light a downforce, it cost me over 20 bushel. Too much downforce on the excessive side, side didn't cost me that much because we were in those somewhat drier conditions. If this would flip and we'd have wet conditions, this would just be the opposite. But 20 bushel difference on downforce times the price of corn, and we're over $75 an acre by not getting downforce correct. But we can fix this. We can, we can fix this with the sensing technology and measuring and reacting. Now, we also had a study, we call it the all wrong study, where we said, okay, we're going to get three, three things wrong on the, on the planter, three popular things that we can get, get wrong. One of them is going to be downforce that we just talked about. So we'll go too light on the downforce side, and then we go to our meters. We're always struggling to get the best singulation out in the field, okay? We're always working on that, 99% plus. We put goof plates in to get doubles and skips, and we bring singulation down to 95%. So that's the second thing we do wrong. And the third thing, we go to those residue managers, we go to clean sweep and we say lift up and let's act like we don't even have them on the planter. We did that compared to doing these things all correctly in a side-by-side -side replicated situation and we're seeing almost a 40 bushel loss just by those simple three things. Times the price of corn, it's over $140. Those were, those were severe this year at the PTI farm. You're going to hear more about planter pitfalls today. We've got a session with Matt Bennett and Troy McCowan. They're going to talk about maintenance and calibration on the planter. They're going to talk about you can put all this technology on a planter, but if we don't use it right, we don't have a planter working in good condition, it's not going to do us any good. I think you'll find that interesting. What about planting depth in relationship to soil moisture? I remember as a kid, when, when I first got in that planter tractor, I asked my dad, I said, Dad, how, how deep are we supposed to plant corn? He said, well, it depends. And I said, well, what do you mean it depends? And he says, you got to plant into moisture. Was he right? He was right. I was expecting him to say a number, two inches, two and a half inches, inch and a half, something. But he said, you got to plant it into moisture. Th this is our planting depth study at the PTI farm. We run planting depths shallow of an inch, and then we go what some would consider way too deep at three inches. And here's the data. And this is one of my pet peeves. There's a lot of folks that, that do some research and they'll show planting depth data, but they don't say what happened. So if you look at this planting depth data, it tells you that when I planted too shallow at an inch, that was my lowest yield. But when I planted at the deepest setting, the three inches, it was my highest yield. But why, why did this happen? We're sensing at the PTI farm. We're running Smart Firmer, and one of the attributes Smart Firmer can do for us, it can tell us how much furrow moisture we have at planting depth. 
okay? So I mentioned earlier, I try to plant a lot of my corn at two inches, but I've got to get it into moisture. So we're doing this depth study. We've got smart firmer working for us. And as we're planting these different depths of an inch all the way up to three inches, we're looking at the furrow moisture percentages. And let's go back to this study. Here it is, the inch shallow side to the three inch deep side. I'm not too concerned about the inch. I don't think many of you guys are gonna do that. Let's just concentrate on the popular planter depth settings and I'm gonna start with two inches. So we pull that data out. Here's two inch planting depth. Smart firmer's going to work for me. I'm planting away on the 2020. It's telling me I've got 18% furrow moisture. Do you guys know what the furrow moisture should be for adequate germination and emergence? What should Smart Firmer be telling us for the right furrow moisture? Anybody know? 30%, yeah, you guys are on it. That's what R&D has, has, has found in their testing, that we need to have that value as close to 30% as possible. I'm at 18%. I'm sitting in the planter tractor, I'm planting this study, and the 2020 and Smart Firmer are saying, Jason, at two inch corn, you're at 18% moisture. What do I do? What would you do? Go deeper, that's exactly right. So. I've got smart depth on the planter. This, this particular planter that we're planting this study with, we remove the T-handles on the back side of the planter where we control depth. We're putting an electric motor. You'll hear more about this today. And at the press of a button, I can change the depth of my row units and I can go deeper. Here's what it looks like on our planter, a 16 row planter. All those T-handles gone, we've got electric motors there. We go to the 2020 and say, you know what? We were set up at two inches, let's go deeper. So we've got some presets in here. And I said, let's go a half inch deeper. We go from two to two and a half. So we go, we're planting at two and a half. We're looking at the 2020. We're looking at what smart firmers bringing into us. Our furrow moisture goes up, but we're at 27%. We're still not at that 30%. So what do we do? We go back to the 2020 into smart depth. And we say, let's go a little deeper. Let's get into that 30%. But now I'm planting corn at three inches in depth. But look at the yield response. So just in this scenario, we're seeing almost an eight bushel difference. And over the whole study, we were seeing differences in dollars of just over $45 just by our depth setting. But we're, we're setting that depth according to moisture and using smart depth. You're gonna hear more about this from Troy Endress and Justin McMenemy in their session today. And I think you'll really enjoy that. When we rank revenue, nitrogen comes to the table. How do we feed corn? How do we give it the right rate of nitrogen at the right time? Every year, it seems like this one comes up. And so we do a lot of nitrogen uh, management testing at the PTI farm. We're looking at different placements. We use weed and feeds. We use uh, nitrogen on the planter, and we're side dressing, okay? We are putting nitrogen on the planter. I don't know how many of you folks are doing this, but I want to take you to a typical row unit where we're putting nitrogen on the planter through conceal, and we're, doing, we're making this application through the gauge wheels. We're using existing space of the planter. We're not hanging coulters. We're not hanging those heavy tools to apply nitrogen on the planter. We're going into existing spaces like the gauge wheels. Here that row unit turns around and you can get a good look. We can go single band or we can go di uh, dual band, a knife inside that gauge wheel to apply our nitrogen product. And we do a lot of work with both corn and soybeans with this single and dual band application. You see, we're taking our planter, we're putting tanks and pumps on it. And I, I know it can be a little bit of a struggle logistically in having the tanks and pumps to pump more liquid on the planter. But this has been one of my biggest returns on the farm, putting nitrogen on the planter. I'm gonna talk about just nitrogen, but we're doing work with sulfur and boron along with the nitrogen, because those are products I can't put in the furrow because they're not seed safe. But I put them three inches away with Conceal and we're seeing tremendous yield response with both corn and soybeans. Here's where we're going in with Conceal, right in the gauge wheel. We've got a spoke wheel and you can see that knife. It's kind of a backwards knife where we come in. And this is not a deep application from this knife. This is only about an inch and a half in depth. Again, three inches away in the center of that gauge wheel. This is how the, the, the placement looks. The blue dots is where we're placing our nitrogen, our sulfur and our boron. Look at those crown roots. The crown roots are just going, they're growing at a 35 degree angle, almost right into that zone. We call this luxury product. It's not that we're putting more than we should on. It's just a great placement where the corn can actually get it. You see, years ago, we were using two by two placements. And I hate the word two by two, I really do. Years ago, we were putting starter fertilizer on and things and we're using two by two placements. And look at the blue dot of the two, two by two placement. A true two by two is where you're placing nutrients two inches over from the seed, but yet two inches lower than the seed. So if you're planting corn like I am at two inches, your two by two placement should be four inches deep. 
And I don't think many growers are doing that. They call it two by two, but here's the thing. We've got lots of products, lots of fertilizer products out in the marketplace that we're buying and we're applying on the planter, and some of them are salty. We get them too close to the seed and they can cause some issues. So if someone's selling a fertilizer attachment, what's wrong with telling us where the actual placement is? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I want to know that information. And when a grower tells me he's putting on a two by two, I've got to ask him, ask him what attachment he's using because typically it's not four inches in depth. Some people want to call it a two by two by two. Conceal is not a two by two by two. We're not going four inches in depth. Three inches on each side, an inch and a half deep. And you can go single band or dual band. Here's what it looks like out in the field. Here's what it actually, actually looked like at PTI on some of our April plantings where we had cool, wet conditions. We've got nitrogen on the planter on the right side and look at the response to that corn. The corn on the left, the yellower corn, has got the same amount of nitrogen on it just as a weed and feed. See, here's what's happening. Years ago, and I don't remember when this happened, but we were all, a lot of us anyway, were putting on one-shot nitrogen applications. This was years ago. We realized that that probably wasn't the best way to put nitrogen on. We wanted to go to a split application of nitrogen. Okay? So we went from applications like this, putting our herbicide on, putting all our nitrogen on, and we were done. And we said, well, this, this, we can do a lot better than this. And we went to split applications. Maybe some of weed and feed plus side dressing that corn once it came up. And that seemed pretty reasonable to us because we saw some really nice yield returns. This past year, we saw a 14 bushel yield response by doing that at the PTI farm. But see, here's the thing that's happening, and no one ever told me this. See, my status quo on our home farm is we never put nitrogen on the planter. We had never done it. Grandpa didn't want to do it. Dad didn't want to do it. So guess what? I didn't do it. But here, no one told me this. When we start putting nitrogen on the planter, we're seeing some of the same responses we saw years ago when we went to a split application. And so now we're using some wheat and feed, especially in my corn after corn uh, trials that we do. We're putting nitrogen on the planter and we're still side dressing like we always have. But guys, look at the additional yield response. It's over and above, or right at where we were at when we, we went, to, went to a split application. We're picking up another 14 bushel. And this has been one of the big yield gainers and profitability gainers at the PTI farm. Just going to a split application, I think, helped us out years ago. I and mean, we're using that as our control in all of the trials that we do. And that's the black line, the blue bar right here. But we create the crosshairs and says, you know what? This was our status quo years ago. That weed and feed coming in with a side dress, can we do better? And there's one, two, three, four, five programs that are beating that status quo program. This is what I want to monitor every year, and I want to find out why the crosshairs right there, those black crosshairs, my program, who's beating me? How much are they beating me by, and is it something that I need to look at on my farm? What programs are winning? What beat my status quo? All of those programs are nitrogen on the planter. The best program I've got is 25% of my nitrogen down as a weed and feed, especially for my corn after corn acres and then I put 25% of my nitrogen on the planter. Ends up being about 15 to 17 gallon on the planter. Everybody says, well, gosh, how can I feed that planter? How can I keep the planter rolling? Having a hard enough time putting seed in it. Now you're telling me I gotta put liquid in it. I'm only going 15 to 17 gallon, that's it. It's not a tremendous amount of gallons. And we can feed this thing. And then we come back and we side dress just like we always have. But that's been my big winner at PTI. But it does involve nitrogen on the planter. How much is it winning by? We've got three-year data, and I laugh a little bit because academia, the university folks say, well, Jason, to prove whether something's repeatable year in and year out, you need three years of yield data. And for Conceal, this was our third year. 2019 was our third year of testing nitrogen on the planter, and we're about $60 ahead compared to our split application program, weed and feed down early at a 50%, and then coming in a side dress, and we're $60 ahead. And this is what I like about this. Guys, my nitrogen cost is the same. We have a few programs where we drop the rate 25% and I in, increase the rate 25%, but most of these programs are same cost. The $60 to the acre that I'm comparing it to has the same cost as some of these popular programs out here. I'm not spending any more money on nitrogen, but I'm bringing in another $60 on the backside. That's why I say it's been so powerful for us to look at nitrogen on the planter. This data is only nitrogen. But when I do it on the planter, I'm adding in the sulfur. We're a seven to one ratio on sulfur to nitrogen. So every seven parts of nitrogen I'm putting on, I'm putting one part of sulfur. 
just because that sulfur we know, is, it'll run on us. We get some rainfall, we get moisture, and it'll run with the moisture. So we have to put sulfur on anytime we put nitrogen on. We're doing it through conceal. It's the perfect placement for it. I can't put it in the furrow with, with many of the products that we're using. Let's stay on the nutrition side. Starter fertilizer has been big for us, but to set up starter fertilizer, I've got to tell you a little bit about what we're doing on the farm with our reallocation program. We're counting on liquid starter fertilizer every single spring, but I'm not paying double for it. What do I mean by that? I'm using dry fertilizer. I'm using it for maintenance and buildup. I'm putting that out. But if I'm planning on a liquid program, I have to account for that. I'm not spending any more dollars than I need to, and I'm definitely not putting on any more nutrients than I have to. Agronomically, we're going to be sound. Environmentally, we're going to be sound as well. So a reallocation program, what is that? You're going to hear about this from Corey Mulbauer in his fertility session. I think you'll get a kick out of it. But basically what we're doing is, is we're saying, you know what, we're going to put a starter program on the planter. We know, we know what the cost is going to be. We know what nutrients we're putting on, and we're going to reallocate. So we're reducing some of the dry fertilizer we're applying in the fall to account for the liquid program going on in the spring. I always joke with growers, a starter fertilizer shouldn't cost you any money. It should be free. What do I mean by that? We're going to spend the same dollars for our fertility program. Okay, that's how we address this thing. Here's some of the programs. We, we, we look at different products through FurrowJet and our starter fertilizer programs. I'll go through a couple with you just real quick because we don't have a lot of time here this morning. But here's Nature's, a 10.18.4. And, and look, we look at different rates and we try to find the economic optimum rate. Which rate of the product actually made us the most money compared to which one gave us the highest yield? It's one of the interesting things to look at. Here's a Marco product. We work with Marco Fertilizer. We're looking at different rates of their LTE product. But look at the revenue gains. This is after the cost of product. This is after reallocating our dry fertilizer, putting the liquid on, and almost $25 net gains. Here's Sunrise Co-op out of Ohio working with some of their products, $17, $18. They're all positives. Here's Helena with some OFOS. All of these are giving us positive returns by the reallocation in the starter fertilizer program on the planter. So you'll hear more from Corey talking about that, and especially the reallocation, because I think that's important as we look at putting starter fertilizer on the planter. Okay, let's change gears a little bit. Closing the furrow. This is a, a popular one. It's a, it's a popular problem. Sometimes I'll get out of the planter tractor and I'll go back and say, how well of a job am I doing closing? You know, that last component of the planter that's supposed to close that trench that we make. And you look at the soil surface sometimes after getting out of the cab of that tractor and you look at it and say, I think it looks pretty good on the soil surface. But then we get our pocket knife out, we dig a little bit. Anybody ever seen something that looks like this next to the seed? What is that? That's an air pocket. And how in the world is a seed supposed to germinate if the embryo is not attached to water? When we talk about seed to soil contact, that's where we have a seed that has moisture. And there's an embryo, if you see on this, this, this corn kernel right here, that white area right there, that's the embryo. That's the part that needs to imbibe water so it'll germ. That's where the germ comes out of it. Is that germ connected to water right now? No, it's connected to air. And so it's going to sit there and wait until a rainfall comes to collapse that air pocket, and then she'll finally germinate. But now you've got a late emerger coming up out of the ground. But what's a closing system supposed to do for you on your planter? When you go to the field in 2020 here, and you're planting away, what's the closing system supposed to do? Two major things. One, lift and fracture, blow out the sidewall. We've got openers that create that furrow. We're replacing the seed in the bottom of it. If it's got moisture in it, something like we had in 2019, right? Sometimes if we have high moisture, we're creating a soil density layer, and that closing system is supposed to blast those sidewalls right out of there. The other thing our closing system is supposed to do is push the air pocket out, lift and fracture, and blow that air pocket out. But the problem is most of the closing systems that we have today can't do both of those things. It can only, a lot of times, just do one. This is my planter. I'm in the planter tractor planting away. If I look back, can I see my closing wheels? It's one of the problems I've had with closing systems. I can't see them working. I can turn around and I can see the residue managers in the front of the planter. I can see the row units, but I can't even see the closing, closing system. This picture is taken from behind the planter. How many closing systems can you see on the 16 row planter? We're behind it off to the side and I can see row number one. Can you see the closing systems on rows 2 through 16? Can you see them? No. 
So we don't know how to set these things, and we can't even see them while we're actually planting corn in the field. This has been a real problem for me. When we go and do agronomy meetings, I ask folks, when you go to the field this spring, what closing system are you going to be using on your planter? And almost half the people that I talk to say, we are using the dual rubber closing system. This has traditionally been the most popular closing system on planters over the last five, 10 years, I suppose, right? And longer. But this is a closing system I won't even test anymore. When new closing systems come out, these new wheels that come out and say, hey, we got a better mousetrap here, what do they compare themselves to? This system. Because we know it's not a good situation right now. It's not lifting and free. Can, can that system right there lift and fracture a sidewall? No, it can't. Can it push an air pocket out? Maybe. Got enough pressure and tension on it. I think it might. But it can't lift and fracture a sidewall. So when all these new wheels come out, there's a better mousetrap. They're always comparing themselves to this. I know they're going to be better. I know they're going to win. So I won't even test them. I, I'll just put all these new situations together and we'll test them. Here's where we keep one of the rubber wheels on, but we just put a spike wheel next to it. This is a Yetter Poway Twister. A lot of folks are using those. A lightweight plastic wheel. Here's where we put both of them on, eliminate the dual rubber completely. We're testing those. Then we bring in some of the heavier system. This is a Martin, a dual dimple system. One of these wheels weighs 19.2 pounds, I think, as we measured it at the PTI farm. You put two of them on, now all of a sudden you got a 40 pound tail compared to some of those pl lighter plastic ones that may only be five or six pounds. Now, that T-handle you see there attached to that tail, where do you set that now that I've got a heavier unit? It's a problem. Here's some cast fingers. So we're looking at different, different systems out there in the field. The T-handle that I mentioned, where do you set this thing? This, this T-handle is attached to a spring, and this is what's going to give us the aggressiveness of that closing system. Where do you set it at? We did a study in 2018, our first year at PTI. We had conventional, or, uh, conventional tillage in a corn after corn environment, and it was what I thought was beautiful planting conditions. I mean, it was nice. And we said, let's take these dual poly twisters and let's put them in different settings, notch settings for tension. And so you see the, the red lines up here. It shows notch zero all the way to notch four. Okay, light setting versus heavy. And we took them to the field and we said, let's just analyze this. And we found over a 26 bushel yield difference from going too light to too heavy. That times the price of corn that year in 2018 was almost a $90 difference in our closing system. And this is invisible. We don't even know this is happening. We don't know how to set these things. We can't see them working on the planter, but yet we're seeing losses like this. We don't even know this is happening. I was up in Dixon, Illinois, doing a, an agronomy meeting here a couple of weeks ago, and I thought they're in an area where they've got some really nice soils, and there was about 100 farmers in the room, and I said, I'm going to ask them this question. I'm going to ask these guys in these good soils up here, how many of you folks think you have soil variability? Again, about 100 farmers in the room. 100% of them said, yep, we've got soil variability. We've got changes in soil type. We've got changes in soil texture. We've got changes in water holding capacity. And I said, wow, all of you are admitting this. And then I asked them, knowing that you have the variability, are you changing that T-handle on your closing system to account for that soil variability? 89% of them said, nope, we just set it and we forget it. 11% of those growers lied to me and said, yes, we are changing. <laughs> I think that's what they meant to tell me. But it's, it's hard to do it, hard to go back, stop the planter to change the T-handle and change the setting, isn't it? it, it it's a problem. So let's talk about sensing technology again. We talked about that with downforce. Why should it be any different with our closing system? Why can't we have a, a, a you know, technology in the cab of the tractor that monitors how well we're closing the trench, closing the furrow? We've got furrow force that we brought to the PTI farm for the first time this year. And we used it in corn and soybeans and used it to monitor or to close the trench and monitor how well we're doing compared to our older systems that, that we've got in place. And see, Furrow Force is a sensing system. It's an integrated system where we're sensing, measuring how much ground contact do we have to lift and fracture the sidewall and to push the air pocket out. How well of a job is it doing? In this spot here, and we're going to measure and find out what's the perfect setting to close the furrow, to lift and fracture and push the air pocket out. But over here, it may be a different setting, and so we're going to measure it, find out what the difference is, and then we're going to react and change. So it's a robust closing system, but it's, it's a sensing system. So let's take it to some of our corn trials. We brought the combine in. We said, we've got all these different closing uh, situations in the field. Let's just go harvest them and see if there's any yield difference. The first study I did, corn after corn, planted last week of April, tough conditions. The sensing system, 
that furrow force closing and sensing system one by nine and a half bushel. And my first question was why? Why are we seeing a win with this new closing system sensing and changing reacting in this particular trial? We go back and we look at the emergence. We capture emergence on a lot of the trials, most all the trials that we do, and we're finding more plants up out of the ground, which equated to more ears that we were able to run through the combine. I always tell growers, if we want to increase yield, harvestable ears is a pretty good place to start. And we got more harvestable ears with this sensing closing system. That yield increase times the price of corn, 367 again, about 35 bucks an acre. And I'm scratching my head saying, what's happening here? This is the first time we've seen this data. And so, Again, why is it happening? I do think it's a, it's a robust closing system. I do, but guys, I think the difference is the sensing. I think the moving of that, that closing system, measuring where we're at in the field right now and getting the perfect close and finding out this situation over here, it's different. We measure it, we find it, and we react. That's where I think we're getting the yield. Sounds a lot like downforce, doesn't it? It's the same thing, and I don't think it should be any different. So we've got that module on here where we, we do have a sensing system on the, on the furrow now. Let's take these wheels and look at different tillage. And I'm gonna show you different tillage because I think that the difference in tillage is kind of the same thing of you guys having variability in your fields. See, I'm doing no-till, I'm doing conventional till. That's a big drastic change in soil density. It represents change. And I think we've got all changes going on in our fields. Here's the conventional tillage making that soil black. Right? So how does the closing systems do in that environment versus a no-till? Here's some strip-till. I'm going to show you some strip-till data. The strip-till that I put in in the fall of 18 is the best I've ever had. I mean, it was beautiful strips. And when we brought the planter in, it was an easy environment for it to close. And I'll show you the differences in that environment versus a straight no-till, which was a little tougher, as we all know. You see, we run the planter, we plant our corn, we plant corn and soybeans in this situation. Here's corn, but we flag it. As soon as it comes up out of the ground, peeking right up out of the soil surface, we flag it. And we monitor what's the difference in emergence timing. You guys ever done this, this flag testing thing? If you haven't, I would encourage you to do it because you'll find some interesting things in the field. You'll find variability. When we flag test a plot, we want it to be all red flags because that means all the corn came up within 18 hours. It doesn't work that way all the time. Sometimes we'll get trials that have multicolor flags. And that means the corn came up at different times. And that, that's, that's a bad situation, right? We get that late emerger, corn that came up later. Here's a seed that had an air pocket next to it. Finally got enough moisture, poked its head up out of the ground. And what's the first thing that corn plant saw when it got out of the ground? Two big brothers on each side of it. And so this guy's gonna be fighting for water and precious nutrients all year long and probably won't even throw an ear on it. What's the yield penalty of this? We've been monitoring this at PTI. The last two years we do flag testing and those late emergers that we get, what's the yield penalty? After 18 hours up to 28 hours, those second emergers, that's about a 17% yield loss. We go out to 42 hours, it's about 24%. And here's the big one, we get past 42 hours and we're losing half of our yield. You see those ears you see up here, those nice size consistent ears, those are all the ears that came up within 18 hours of themselves. But the other smaller ears are the ears that came up 42 hours later. That's what we're giving up with these late emergers and that's costing us in yield. Now, let's go back to no-till with our closing systems out here. We're seeing a 10 bushel difference in the way our closing systems are working in that tough environment. 10 bushel differences, those are some big dollar values right there. We go to the flag testing where we had the no-till and you'll see the difference in emergers, the difference in timing. And we get these late stragglers. We didn't close the furrow property and we get these guys that are coming up way too late. And in my opinion, that's what's bringing the yield down. We go to the strip till and the whole thing changes. Remember I told you my strip till was just beautiful conditions and it was easier to close. Actually furrow force got beat in this situation. It got beat. That's okay, it just tells us the differences in the conditions that we were planning in. That's what we need to learn from. We go back and we look at the flag testing in the strip till and look at the amount of late stragglers. They're lower. We're doing testing on closing the furrow in soybeans as well. We've spent a lot of our time here this morning talking about uh, corn. We're doing it on soybeans as well. This past year in all of the same tillage, the no-till, conventional, strip till, vertical till, the same wheels we talked about, we're about a 2.3 bushel win with the automatic sensing with our new closing system furrow force. 
Take that times the price of soybeans and we're about $20 difference. Here's one interesting study, and you'll hear more about this in corn later on today, but I wanted to do an automatic sensing trial, closing the furrow versus a manual trial. Because I think we're going to have some growers that say, you know what, I want, to, I want this new closing system, but I'll monitor it manually. I'll read it and then I'll change it accordingly myself versus having it do it automatically. And so this one was really interesting to me because the automation actually was $17 an acre better than me stopping the tractor and going out and changing it. So in a manual setting, I just don't think I can change it fast enough. But the automatic setting was doing a pretty good job and we're getting a pretty good, a pretty fast payback from that. So you'll hear more about this, the, the, some of the impact of soil density with closing the trench. We'll also talk about downforce with Doug Wiegand and Will Frank later on today. All right, so everything we've talked about thus far has been revenue, gains or losses from the PTI farm that I would consider investments that pay for themselves fast. Everything we talked about, I think, will pay for themselves in one growing season. I really think that. What about some other investments we're looking at that's going to take a little bit more than one year to pay for itself? The large capital investments that may take a while to pay off, but once we do get it paid off, it's going to give us some really big returns. And I ranked those top five. And it was interesting to look at it. This is where tile really comes to the forefront. Anybody need more tile in 2019 with the wet weather we had? What a year to put tile in and see the advantages of getting that water away. Irrigation was, was something that was huge too, but those are large investments, but I wanna show you what we're doing with it and some of the return we're seeing from the, this, this type of practice. So we have a water management study at PTI where we're looking at getting water away, but then turning around and recycling that water. PTI was a wet farm when we acquired it in 18. I mean, this thing didn't have any tile in it. We've got the interstate on one side of us and the city of Pontiac on the other side. I know why there's no tile on this farm because they had no outlet. They could have put tile in, but they got nowhere to send the water to. And so this is an interesting area of the PTI farm. This is the lowest part of the farm, lowest elevation. When I get a big rain, this is where water stands. I call it the prairie pothole. You guys have any prairie potholes on your farms at home? Where it needs drainage, but you can't put tile in, you can't get water away, this is my prairie pothole. So we said, you know what, let's just make it bigger. Last winter we came in with high hose and bulldozers and we said that low elevation area, let's make it bigger. How big? It's about two and a half acres in size, and we cut it 25 foot deep. And we said, now we've got a real prairie pothole. Well, what are we gonna do with this thing? We're gonna develop a reservoir. We created our own outlet for water. Now that we've got a, a place for water to go, we're gonna bring the tile machines in now. We're gonna, we're gonna increase soil health. We're gonna bring oxygen back into the soil and try to, try to, to grow some great yielding crops. We looked at different pattern tile systems on the farm. I wanted to look at the agronomic value of it as well as the economics of it. How long is it going to take to pay for this stuff? I wanted to evaluate that, and this was a perfect situation. But not only are we getting water away from the tile, we're going to bring it in the reservoir and we're going to recycle it. See, here's what happens, guys. It's going to rain. Rain goes through the soil profile and goes down through the soil and finds the tile, and the tile takes the water away but I don't send it to the river system. I don't get rid of that water completely. I dump it in the reservoir and I hold it for dear life because what I want to do is bring that rainwater back in to irrigate my crops. So let's go back to our tile. Here's our different tile that we have in the field. We put 30, 30 foot pattern tile, 60 foot, and I even went some 120s even though I didn't think that was the best thing to do, but I wanted to evaluate it to see the difference. In our 30 foot pattern tile, this did not surprise me, but brought in over 40 bushel yield gains on corn. 60 foot pattern tile, it just about cut them in half, down to 22, and the 120 gave me a little bit of response, only about 3.7. The major yield response was over top of the tile, but if I go that whole section of where I tiled it, it couldn't get water away outside of the tile, and that's where she struggled. I needed more laterals in that system. How fast will it take to pay this, 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 this stuff off, this, this different pattern tile? If we'd have a 2019 for the next five years, it'd be totally paid off on the 30 foot pattern tile. The yield response we saw, it would pay for itself quickly. 60 foot about nine years and 120 foot, it might take a while, almost 50 years to get that system paid off. So some big differences. But I'm interested in not only the drainage, I'm interested in the irrigation because I'm like a lot of farmers. I was like a lot of farmers. I didn't have the capacity to irrigate my crops. I didn't have water. Now that we've got the reservoir in the water, we can recycle that rainwater. 
We're using drip. When you come to the PTI farm, you're going to see our drip that we, we lay this, thing, this stuff manually. We do not put it in the ground. I do not install it 16 inches deep, 18 inches deep, whatever people are doing. I don't do it. I put it right on top of the ground. Our team does this so you can come out and see it. Here's a drip tape in, in corn. And you can walk up to this tape and you can pick it up and you can see it dripping water. You can see us putting fertigation through this line. It's the whole learning process of the PTI farm. I want this on top. It is super labor intensive to lay it like this and then to pick it up and then use it again next year. But it's the only way I can show you folks how this is working. Did it do us any good? <laughs> I got a call from the uh, USDA. The other day I'm driving into Tremont, we had a dealer meeting and I'm on the phone in the truck and I see this phone call coming in from Washington DC. And I'm like, I don't think I'm gonna answer this one. And I'm still on the phone and the Washington DC call comes in again. And they give up because I'm still on the phone, it rings again. They were, it rang 10 times from Washington DC and I'm thinking, I'm either wanted by the IRS or something's happening here. And so I get off my phone and I call the Washington DC number and it's the United States Department of Agriculture. It's Sunny Purdue's office. And they said, do you have this water management project over in Pontiac, Illinois at this PTI farm? And I said, yes, sir, we do. And so we've got some questions for you. He said, what kind of questions do you have? And they said, well, just tell us about the system, what you're doing with recycling this rainwater. We kind of like the idea of this. What kind of yield responses are you seeing? And I said, sir, I'd love to talk to you about it. Because I said, this year we're seeing 75 bushel yield gains in corn from recycling water, using tile to get rid of water and then bringing that rainwater back into irrigate our crops. And I said, it's 75 bushel. He said, that's pretty good. And I said, no, it's not good enough. I said, you see, we laid the drip, the recycling of the water, right when the corn was pollinating. It was too late. We were still constructing the system. We weren't done with it in time. I said, it should have been over 100 bushel. And he's like, I can't believe this. He says, not only are you getting water away, drainage-wise, but you're recycling that water. And he says, do you think you're getting less water in the Mississippi River, less rainwater in the Mississippi River as a result of this program? I said, yes, I, I do. I don't know how much. But why, are we, why were we having that conversation? We mentioned prairie potholes before. I think all of you had prairie potholes. And what if now we could put a drainage system in on the farm? And what if we could create an opportunity to irrigate when we never had that opportunity before? I would love to put a, a, a federal program together to allow growers to do that. So hopefully we'll be able to talk more with them going forward. But some huge yield gains by being able to look at the drainage, do it properly, and then reuse that water. We're also doing it on soybeans, and we continued the conversation with the USDA about not only corn yields, but soybean yields as well. And I want to show you my high yield soybean study. And for the high yield, I'm using irrigation. I don't have any tile underneath it yet. I'm just recycling the water. But I'm also looking at at plant nutrition for this high yield study that I'm going to share with you. So we're using Conceal that we talked about earlier for corn, remember? Now we're using it for soybeans. We're using FurrowJet. I showed you what we're doing for corn. Now we're using it for soybeans. Now, this irrigated study comes compliments of Walmart. If you've been to PTI, you know we farm right by the Walmart in Pontiac, and every Walmart has a retention pond where they take all the water off the parking lot and put it in this retention pond. That's what spurred the whole idea of our water management program. We got permission from Walmart to go in here and take water from their retention pond to irrigate our crops, and that's what we're doing with our drip tape. We're also looking at nutrition on the planter. And this was a fun trial this year because we, you'd come to the farm, we, we'd get on a, a buggy and a tractor, we'd go out into our studies, and we'd just smile sometimes because every day this happened. So we wouldn't even get to this trial and people would be looking ahead because they'd see the visual differences in, the, in this plot and they'd say, what's that? Every day it happened. What is that? What is that difference? 30 inch rows, we've got irrigation here, no tile underneath it but we're coming in with our planter and looking at different planter nutrition and we've got some changes happening. We dig plant, plants up and we're seeing some major differences. This was just the start of it. You'll see some major changes like this. Look at the root system. Most, most folks would say soybeans, they're a tap root. They go straight down and I, I agree in general with that, but something's changing with the nutrition we're putting on. I see a root system like that on that soybean plant right there. See the big lateral roots coming straight out this way? You think we can feed them with conceal? What's the placement with conceal? Three inches over, an inch and a half deep, and I think I can feed that root. I think we can change how we feed or how we, we put nutrition to this soybean plant. Here's our drip tape in the field. I want to tell you a quick little story. We were hot and dry in July and August. We actually had our second drought at the PTI. We're due for a really good year in 20, by the way. But we got hot, we got hot dry conditions, and I'm trying to pump as much water as I can through the drip. Here's a picture of it. 
and we're trying to put so much water, we're running high pressure. I'm running too high a pressure, and when I do that, we get blowouts. And so in this high yield plot, the drip, it blew out on us. And what happens is it's like a garden hose going at high pressure, and it causes erosion. It actually melts the soil off of the roots. And we walk out here to make the repair of the drip line, and we see the roots. And I thought, well, that's last year's corn root, because this is rotated, corn soybean rotation. And I said, that's just last year's corn root. Am I right? No, that's a soybean root. Anybody have soybean roots that look like this at home? This was interesting to me. I said, wait a minute, this is a fibrous root system. Most people will tell me, and I agree, that soybeans have a tap root. That is not a tap root. And what we're finding on these 30 inch beans that with these fibrous root systems are in the center of a 30 inch row. Here's another picture, and if you look close enough, you'll find nodulation of these soybeans, these fibrous root systems in the center of a 30 inch row. And so what's happening here? Yes, these are irrigated. So we go into the non-irrigated part of this study because a lot of growers can irrigate. So we're doing the same with the at plant nutrition trials in a non-irrigated setting. And we dig those up in the center of the 30 inch row and I don't find these roots. They're not there. It's the taproot version that we all knew soybeans had in the past, but something's changing here. You see the soybean roots are sensing where we're putting the food and where we're putting the water and it's flourishing. And what's wrong with that picture? Knowing how a, how a soybean plant wants to root and find its nutrition, find that out and then go feed it. Did it increase yield? Well, the beans looked a lot better. I was worried about creating some tall beans, too tall and rank beans. This is an interesting picture because you look at the beans on the, the right-hand side of Mark, one of, the, one of our teammates at the PTI farm. That's our dry fertilizer program. Remember what I talked about with reallocation? That's just dap and potash in the fall. On the other side, the left side of the picture is where we dropped the dry fertilizer rates and then came in with liquid and conceal and furrow jet and we created a different animal. We go out there and we look at the, the leaf structure, not only the root structure, but the leaf structure, the trifoliates are almost double in size. If I could go back and do one thing over again, I would have dropped the seeding rate of this particular trial. We planted these beans on June 12th, kind of late, right? Like a lot of you folks did. My seed company, I went to them and said, I'm planting a high yield study on June 12th. Well, what should my seeding rate be in these 30 inch row beans? And what, what do you suppose they told me? The higher the better. I dropped them at 130, 130,000. If I could go back again, knowing that what we did to this trifoliate size, I would have dropped it to 100. We could have done it because we wanted the early canopy. That's why folks will say you need a higher seeding rate. We want that canopy and that longer growing season as fast as we can. But we were doing that with the increase of these trifoliate leaves. It was incredible. Did it do us any good yield wise? We had 100 bushel twice. I never thought we'd hit, I mean, we called it a high yield study. I didn't think we'd hit, a, hit 100, but we did it in two situations. And both of those situations were with conceal. Let's just go through one by one. Here's our control, the red bar there, that's 88 bushel beans. And then we go to furrow jet. We look at the center. Furrow jet's a three-way band, right? One of the bands is right in the center where the seed's at, and we put a carbohydrate source, a sugar called Boost. Got a little bit of yield increase out of that. Then we go to the wings of furrow jet. We're using agro liquids, P and K liquid product, and we're trying to increase yield that way. We got some yield response out of it. But then we go to the conceal treatments, and that's where the big advantage was. We had one treatment where we're running just a little bit of nitrogen in conceal, because again, we can't put that anywhere near the seed on soybeans. We're running a little bit of nitrogen in a product called 141246. We made specific, specifically for soybeans and conceal, and we're seeing some huge yield gains. Anywhere we had conceal, the nitrogen in the 141246, we hit 100 bushel. Here's the individual yield gains from each of the, the placements of nutrition, again, in an irrigated environment. We're bringing in over $150 of revenue in this situation. I go back to my call with the USDA. This is what we're looking at. This is the type of revenue we're bringing in, and it's incredible. Irrigation in general, when the secretary's office asked me, he says, how much yield increase are you getting on soybeans? And I said, it was interesting to look at it because we averaged about 25 bushel in every setting just by bringing in water to irrigate beans. This was my first year irrigated soybeans, um, and I think I want to do it again because it worked really well. I got, I, I've got a lot more to learn about this, especially with getting it too wet. We want to bring in moisture sensors to really analyze how much water I need to put on it, but I also need to figure out when the right time is. We shut the irrigation down on corn early, and we concentrated on corn and brought the water back in on soybeans late, but we need to really, really look at this going forward, but we saw some nice returns. Let's go back to conceal. 
Here's the, the non-high yield study, and it takes the nitrogen out of some of those high yield applications. We're just looking at that 14, 12, 4, 6, and I'm loving what I'm seeing. This is where everybody was saying, hey, what's that treatment over there? Of those taller beans, those greener beans, and they're giving us some 8, 9, and 10 bushel yield responses and, and just tremendous revenue. And there you see some of those values. And so those ended up in our top 10. Okay, we talked a, a, a lot of data here today, a lot of res, the results from the PTI farm. How do you guys like to get data? I mean, we were only talked about this for just a, a short hour here this morning. How do you like to bring data in and study it and learn from it? You guys like a paper copy? Here is our ongoing version of our paper copy here that we're putting all the trials together. It's like 125 pages right now. It'll probably grow a little bit larger by the time we're all done. Do you guys like paper? Do you like flipping through paper and reading? Do you guys like that to get your data? Yep, got some yeses. How about um, technology? In the age of technology, do you guys like getting data on your iPhone? Yep. Anybody like watching videos? <laughs> I've had some precision planning dealers say, Jason, I don't want to read paper. I just want to hear you talking about it and tell me what the objective was of a trial and tell me if it worked or not. Would anybody like that? Today what we're, we're going to announce is Inside PTI, and this is an online video series where you can sign up to be an insider, and you can get all the information from PTI, some of the stuff that we just talked about today, as well as everything that's in that paper copy. We're going to put a, a video together of every plot that we did, we're just going to say, hey, hey, here's what we're trying to accomplish here, and this is what we found. Okay, so inside PTI, you see this kiosk right here. We have these kiosks all the way in the building here in Tremont, as well as every simulcast location. How do you sign up for this? You go to the iPad, you put your first name in, you put your email address in, and it's that simple. If you've got a phone right now, you can go to insidepti.com and you can see the same screen where you can put your first name and your email address in and you're signed up. And in just a few short weeks, we're gonna start sending videos out. We're gonna talk about just some of the stuff we talked about today. But you'll see some of the inside stuff, the applications that we made. Okay, and learn how we put this stuff together in these short videos. And so I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Can't wait to bring those to you. But this is what the screen will look like. And again, you can go to that at InsidePTI.com. So with that, I've used up all of my time. I thank you guys for coming out to Winter Conference. I, I thank you guys for listening to some of the agronomic research that uh, we've, we've talked about here today. But first and foremost, I want to invite you to the PTI farm this summer. July, August, September, you have a personal invitation to come to PTI. And we can't wait to see you there. So thank you for your time. I'm going to turn it back over to Justin. He'll show you some of the, 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 the logistics of what we're going to do here today. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Great. Great. Thanks, Jason. Great way to start things off, right? Uh, there's a lot to unpack from there. So we're going to spend the rest of the day going into breakout sessions. Those of you in Tremont, are going to, we're going to move around, and I'll kind of explain that. Uh, you're going to travel with us on the, on the simulcast as well. But first, I'm going to pause for a second, and we're going to turn it back to a local host at the simulcast, and then I'll talk through the logistics here in Tremont.